let me now introduce the next guest, who is Irene Khan, who was nine years as the leader of Amnesty International. As such, she was not only the first woman to take that post, but also the first Asian, the first Muslim to lead the world's biggest human rights organization. So let me begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me, giving me this opportunity to talk to you today. I am going to talk to you about Ashraf, and I hope bring a human and a human rights side uh, to the problem of Camp Ashraf. My purpose today in talking to you is to lay out the humanitarian scene and the human suffering in Camp Ashraf and see what the international community should do to stop it. We are talking about 3,400 or so human beings living behind barbed wire in a dusty landscape. Some of them have lived there for almost a quarter of a century because of what they believe in, because of their struggle for freedom. A very large number of them are women. Life has not been easy for them, but never have they been so endangered, isolated, harassed, targeted, and attacked as they are now. Well, as we all know, from 200, 2003, when the coalition forces intervened in Iraq, until the 1st of January 2009, the residents of Camp Ashraf were designated by the U.S. as protected persons under the Geneva Convention. In January 2009, under the agreement signed between the U.S. and the government of Iraq, the U.S. handed over the security of the country to the Iraqi authorities, <laughs> and along with it, also the control of Camp Ashraf. But the status of the residents in the camp was left unclear. The Iraqi government has sent mixed signals about Camp Ashraf. In diplomatic circles, it says it will respect its undertaking not to deport the residents of Ashraf and to treat them humanely. But in reality, on the ground, it has sought to create an untenable situation for the camp residents. It has created a committee for the suppression of Ashraf in the Prime Minister's office. And some senior Iraqi officials have made no bones about their intent to close down Ashraf and to move the people elsewhere. Camp Ashraf is under siege, isolated from normal contact. Now from a human rights and a humanitarian perspective, let me highlight three major concerns. First, the physical attacks on the residents. We all know what happened in July 2009 when there was a two-day attack launched on the camp which left 11 people dead, 36 persons detained, beaten and tortured. According to reports, armed security forces used bulldozers to force their way into the camp in broad daylight. They used water cannons, batons, tear gas against unarmed residents on the other side. And to this day, there has been no independent investigation of the incident, no accountability for the deaths. Now, history and experience shows that impunity breeds more human rights violations. And that is precisely what has happened here, too. The camp is under constant pressure. Threats and attacks have continued. The most recent one was only earlier this month, on the 7th of January in which 176 people were injured, including over 90, 91 or so women. Now, where is that story on the human rights agenda? Where is the call for accountability? The second is concerns about the medical condition. Now, a recent Amnesty International report has set out the difficulties that people face today when they seek medical care because the camp is surrounded by Iraqi security forces. An Iraqi security committee, which is responsible for all matters of the camp, decides about medical treatment. The committee members decide who can travel outside the camp and who will go with them for the treatment. 
they control the influx of supplies into the camp. And for certain serious illnesses, people have to seek medical treatment outside, either in hospitals in Baghdad or elsewhere. And many patients cannot attend their appointments because they're not allowed to take anyone with them. They're not allowed even to take an interpreter with them. The Iraqi government doesn't provide wheelchairs or special beds, which patients sometimes need. And so an already bad medical situation has become worse, leaving many life-threatening and chronic cases without treatment. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, you have those megaphones that we've heard about, loud chants and slogans from 120 loudspeakers going on for about 11 months. Imagine if you have it for an hour, what you feel, and here are people being bombarded with, I would say, uh, noise um, torture. So it's not just physically, but also auditorially that the camp is under siege. Now, psychological pressure is no better, is no less distressing than physical ill treatment. And yet again, that is an issue that doesn't make it to the news. As Governor Richardson said, there is a lot that we do not know about Ashraf. Perhaps there is a lot that we do not want to know about Ashraf because it may make us come face to face uh, with our own uh, judgments and decisions. Now, in case there is any doubt in anyone's mind as to what might happen if people from Ashraf camp were to be returned forcibly to Iran, the regime in Tehran sent us a brutal message only yesterday by executing Jafar Kazmi and Muhammad Ali Hajagai. Now, what was their crime? Chanting slogans supporting PMOI, photographing post-election protests, distributing them on the internet. And yes, one of them had a son in Ashraf. In late December, Ali Saremi, as you know, was hanged without notice. He had visited his son in Ashraf. He was accused of membership of PMI. Four others, including a woman, are on death row for the same reason. All their trials were unfair. Organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have acknowledged that and have also acknowledged reports of ill torture and ill treatment. These days are dark days for human rights in Iran. Executions are being carried out at an amazing speed. Iran executes more people per capita than any other country in the world. Now here I want to acknowledge the courage of Iranian women in their quest for freedom and equality. And I think we should all acknowledge that. Now, the seriousness of the situation in Iran was such that the United Nations General Assembly, in a most unprecedented manner, actually adopted a resolution expressing its concern about the appalling state of human rights in Iran. It mentions torture, violence against women, repression of ethnic and religious minorities, and lack of accountability for human rights violations that followed the post-2009 uh, presidential elections. Now you might say, what is another General Assembly resolution? Yet another paper. But I would ask you to note that we are talking about the United Nations General Assembly, where the majority of governments come from the developing world. This is not the West criticizing Iran. This is the world criticizing Iran. And there is a shift there, and we need to take that shift into account. Now, coming back to Ashraf. The residents of Ashraf were designated by the US as protected persons under the Geneva Convention. And there is now some debate as to whether or not that status has lapsed. But whichever way you argue the law, whichever position you take, international law makes it very clear that no one can be returned to a place where he's likely to be tortured. No one can be ill-treated. Civilians must be treated with humanity, dignity, and respect for their rights. And that places a clear obligation on the Iraqi government to protect the residents of Ashraf from any danger and to ensure their humane treatment. Furthermore, 
Iraq is a state party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which places upon the government the obligation to respect human rights, the obligation not to torture, to treat well, not to expel, deport, send someone forcibly to a place where they may face torture, cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. The government of Iraq cannot escape that obligation, regardless of whether or not it recognizes any status for the residents of Ashraf. The most important attribute of sovereignty is the responsibility to protect people on its territory. The Iraqi government must not be allowed to escape that responsibility. And the international community must hold the Iraqi government to account. <laughs> Pressure and accountability are the tools that the human rights system uses to hold governments uh, to their obligations. Those tools have to be now applied to the Iraqi government. And I don't believe the international human rights system is doing that enough in the case of Ashraf. They need to wake up to their own responsibility uh, in that respect. Now, there is no confidence among the Ashraf residents that the Iraqi authorities will protect them or assist them. On the contrary, there is fear that the opposite is happening. And of course, the behavior of the Iraqi authorities gives substance to those fears. And so, what is the role then of the international community? Now, as a former UN refugee official and a current human rights practitioner, I know from my own experience on the ground that international involvement, and in particular, international presence, is a critical factor in ensuring protection to populations at risk. Now, I was told that UNAMI, the UN operation in Iraq, only visits Ashraf from time to time because it does not feel that it has sufficient security to be there all the time. So, I think presence will go a long way, regular presence will go a long way, regular monitoring will go a long way in providing protection to the people of Ashraf. But there is now incumbent on the UN member states, and in particular on Iraq and on the United States, to make it possible for the UN to establish that presence there and to be there. <laughs> Let's not instrumentalize the human rights of the people of Iran. They have a right to their freedom, they have a right to struggle for their freedom, they have a right to enjoy their freedom, and we have an obligation to support them in their struggle for rights. And that is what Ashraf is all about. It is about focusing on the human rights of the people. It is about focusing on the dignity of the Iranian people. And that's where we should begin with, and that is where we should aim for. Thank you.